We have a very special conversation today. Both of our guests know a lot about central banks, about liquidity, what's going on in the markets. We've got Joseph Wang, former senior Fed trader, Fed guy. His writings can be found at fedguy.com. And Michael Howell, managing director from Cross Border Capital, the godfather of global liquidity. Gentlemen, welcome to Forward Guidance. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Hi, Joseph. Good to see you. Hey, Michael. Great to meet you. Really love your work. Thanks for joining us. The, the feeling is mutual. So, Joseph, I want to start with you. How do you define liquidity? When you were working at the Fed, doing quantitative easing, pumping liquidity into the markets, what did you view what you were doing? What is liquidity? What is the effect of it? I want to hear your definition, and then we'll turn to Michael. Ooh, that's a really hard question. And that's a really good question, too, because people throw out that word all the time. I remember when you were discussing with Michael a while back, I really liked Michael's view of it. There's funding liquidity, for example, being able to finance something, but there's also market liquidity, for example. You sell something, being able to you know, get a price out, price out of it. Um, from, from when I usually look at it, though, I, I look at it more from a balance sheet's perspective. So I think look at things like, for example, for, for a bank, so deposits at the Fed, which are reserves, or if you're not a bank, so bank deposits or money market fund shares, or things like, you know, treasury bills and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of ways that you can look at liquidity. It really depends on what you're at, what, what you're trying to, the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, I think likewise, it's a, it's, it's a complex thing to try and define, but it's really a very important thing. I mean, it's the most important thing, I think, that's affecting markets right now. Uh, we've clearly seen big impacts from liquidity in the last two years through the QE programs of central banks. So what is it? Uh, it's not money supply as normally defined. Uh, money supply is much more a retail bank concept. It's effectively the, the deposits in retail banks. Liquidity is something different for us. It's much more a measure of the financing capacity of the financial sector, the ability to fund positions. Uh, so you can think of it. I mean, we, we try and quantify this uh, in terms of the total amount of credit in the system plus access to savings. And it has many dimensions. It includes what the central banks do. It includes what the private sector, including shadow banks, can create in credit terms. Uh, and it also includes cross-border flows. So there's a number of dimensions. But you know, we began to look at liquidity, uh, or let's say me personally, uh, way back in the, in the mid-1980s when I was at Salomon Brothers, because at that stage, liquidity was really the key thing, or beginning to be the key thing for asset markets. Salomon Brothers, for those of you that don't know, was then the world's biggest uh, trading firm. Uh, it was the market in global bonds, global government bonds, and in Forex. And essentially, it was a huge trading platform where liquidity was the key thing. And what we really learned there was if you, if you monitor money flows and you know where the money is and where it's going, you've got tremendous insight into where asset markets are likely to move. And we've just established this concept globally and tried to measure it. Cross-border capital produces indexes of liquidity for what is now 80 or 90 markets worldwide. And so it's a concept that, we're, that defining is something which is very much uh, at the heart of what we do. Now, our perspective on the market and what we called, uh, you know, for in late, uh, in late 2021 was to say, look, we've got an upcoming bear market. If it's a normal monetary, monetary correction, you've got to think at least 15% down. If you're thinking of a recession as well, it's 30%. And if you get a banking crisis, which I must say, I don't think we're going to get, but if you get a banking crisis, then start thinking of 50% down. But I think it's a 30% one. Uh, it's a decent or decently big bear market. And that's the trouble. Now, the other thing I think to, you know, to, to also contemplate here is that what goes down must come up. And the reality is that the Federal Reserve oversees the financial system, financial stability, and ultimately the health of the real economy. And the Federal Reserve can only do so much tightening until something breaks. Now, something will probably break because the Fed has now got its focus on getting rid of inflation. That is not going to be an easy task. But they've got to try and squeeze the economy hard. And my view, I don't know about Joseph's view or your view, Jack, is they've got to front load that. Uh, and they're going for it in the next six months. So there's an awful lot of pain uh, which the markets and the economy are going to face. Now, it may be that within 12 months, they're on the reverse course again, and they're back to QE. And I think that's not, that's not an unbelievable story. 
uh, I would be thinking very much in terms of that. So for investors, you've got to start thinking about your re-entry point. But please, it's not now. Uh, it's in a few months' time. And that re-entry point will be re-entry into stocks, long-duration stocks. It will include tech. It will include crypto. Uh, and what you're going to see is some very big rebounds in markets. There will be some great opportunities to make money. But as I say, please don't jump in yet. Joseph, would you agree that now is not the time to jump headfirst into the into the pool? I'm glad to be on the exact same side as Michael on this. I think that there's a lot more pain to come. And the charts that Michael's show, shown us, it paints a very compelling picture, right? Seems like the liquidity indicators he has and the risk assets move in lockstep. And if you recall earlier, Jack, as you mentioned, it seems those liquidity indicators have kind of fallen off a cliff. So it looks like we have, we have more to come. And Michael, that... Uh, that index, uh, the global liquidity index, it exploded higher to what I believe is a 50-year high in 2020 and 2021, somewhere around mm -hmm. 85. As of May, it was in the mid 40s, a three-year low. And based, I believe you just put out your news report, and it's it's even lower. So when it, when it went to, what does that mean when the global liquidity index goes from 85 to 45, or perhaps even lower? How much of that is central banks? How much of that is private wholesale dealers? And what is the impact on risk assets? So you went a huge fall we've seen in stocks, crypto, credit. Uh, how much does that apply? How, how does that apply to you know? How much of that is a result of, I should say, the fall in in, in your global liquidity index? Well, I think it, almost everything is to do with the fall in global liquidity right now. I think if you look at uh, you know what's happening in markets, uh, look at the crypto markets, uh, look, you look at what's been happening in the fixed income markets, and certainly in the equity markets since the turn of the year, this is all a liquidity phenomenon. Uh, we'll see that spreading out ultimately into house prices. Uh, we'll see it, uh, you know, appearing in the credit markets, and it's bound to appear in the real economy over the next few months. So I think that this is very much a liquidity phenomenon. Now, you know, what impact uh, does that particular index have? Well, if you look at the movement in liquidity, and as you rightly or correctly say, our global liquidity index latest reading is about 40 on an index that normally ranges from zero to 100. Uh, way back in uh, in 2020, that peaked at just under 90, so the high the high 80s, as you foreshadowed, and we've seen something like, uh, in percentage terms, a 50 55 percent drop in that liquidity index. Now, uh, coincidentally or not, there was a report out, I think, that was uh, reported in the Financial Times uh, a few days ago that said Goldman uh, had estimated that the depth of the mini SPX futures index uh, had declined by 67%. Uh, now, these things are not coincident. Uh, the decline in funding liquidity that we're measuring is leading to this lack of liquidity in the markets. And you just got to look not just at, uh, at the S&P mini futures. I mean, look at the IPO market. It's It's been devastated. This, this is nothing going on. And this is a feature of liquidity. And so what we've got to do is to get a handle on that and try and understand it. And, uh, you know, I would recommend everybody to read Joseph's book, Central Banking 101. It just gives tremendous insight into uh, what central banks do and how they think. Right, Michael, I would recommend every, everyone to read uh, my, Joseph's book, Central Bank 101, but I would also recommend them to read uh, your book, Capital Wars, from which I actually got the name of this podcast, Forward Guidance, which is probably one of the best things about this podcast. I got, I got it from, from the index. I'd like to note that I just got it and I love it so far. I haven't finished it, so highly recommend it as well. Thank you. There we go. Much appreciated. Yeah, I mean, SPACs are de on Monday at $10, and then by Friday, they're literally at, at $3. So you have this connection of uh, to the two definitions of liquidity. Number one is the balance sheet capacity, which, which you talked about. But then you're seeing that in the actual trading markets where just the, the, the bids are not there and the, the market order book is declining, as you say. Michael, in one of your reports you sent over, you said that it's not about the cost of capital. It's about the capacity of capital. Would I be correct in associating the cost of capital with rate hikes, which everyone's focusing on? How high is, can the Fed go? Two, two, 200 basis points, 250 basis points. So that's the cost of capital. Is the balance sheet the uh, quantitative easing and quantitative tightening? And do you think that QT is more important than rate hikes in sort of stopping this inflation tsunami we have? I think it's certainly as important as rate hikes, yeah. I think one's got to think of two dimensions of monetary policy. And it's certainly not the case that the two dimensions, quantity and price, if you like, move together. 
So you could actually have minor moves potentially in interest rates, but they could lead to huge movements in liquidity. And I think this is one of the things to start thinking about. Central banks have got to, have got to monitor both dimensions. Uh, all too frequently, central banks are just looking purely through an interest rate lens. Now, if you come back to why quantity is important, and it comes back to the point that you made about the capacity of the financial system to finance positions. Now, if you read textbooks, conventional economic textbooks, you listen to academics, and probably what is driving many central bankers is the idea that the financial system is a financing system for new capital, okay? Uh, in other words, it's a capital raising mechanism. Actually wrong, it's increasingly and more and more the case, it's a refinancing mechanism. And if you look at the amount of transactions that the financial financial system has to engage in, it's mostly refinancing debt. And if you try and quantify that, Let's look at the amount of debt that's outstanding. $300 trillion worldwide. It's a huge weight on our shoulders. But if you take an average five-year duration or maturity of that debt, you've got to roll the debt of you know, effectively $60 trillion every year uh, by simple maths. Five times 60 gives you that debt stock. Now, $60 trillion is something like six times the new issue market in both fixed income and equity. Uh, if you look at global capex, a global capex spending worldwide out of a what $100 trillion GDP is about 20%, so that's about $20 trillion. So about half what that tells you, about half of capex is actually raised through the capital markets, about $10 trillion of that. But the refinancing burden is six times. So that's what we've got to think about. And to refinance positions, interest rates are not the key thing. They're important, but they're not the key thing. Just think of refinancing your mortgage or rolling your mortgage payments, okay? Uh, what really matters is whether you're going to get the roll, whether a bank will take up the new mortgage, not what interest rate you pay. If you can't get the mortgage, you, you're effectively unhoused. Um, and that's the key thing about it. You've got to get that position rolled. So the main thing is the capacity of the system to roll the debt. The bigger the debt burden, the bigger that problem. And that's why you need liquidity. Now, if you go back to the error that we think central banks made collectively, this is not finger any particular central bank, but the whole universe of central banks made, is they kept interest rates way too low coming out of the, uh, of the recession at the end of the 2000s, the Y2K recession. Now, a lot of that uh, dampening on inflation pressure, uh, which central banks, I think, wrongly read as monetary deflation, was actually cost deflation caused by China entering the World Trade Organization, okay? And what they did is clearly by uh, competing aggressively, bid down prices in goods markets or in the high street worldwide. And that's one of the reasons why inflation was low. Now, central banks read that wrongly in our estimation as being a monetary deflation risk. And therefore they panicked because monetary deflations ain't good. Actually, it was a cost deflation. So what they did is they cut interest rates wrongly. As they cut interest rates, it encouraged more and more and more debt to be taken on because low interest rates are an incentive to debt. And that was very clearly the wrong policy. If you go back uh, to rather bizarrely, I'm going to say this, to the 19th century, and you look at the British financial system, okay, that is a pretty good analogy to maybe what's happening right now, the 19th century credit crises. In 1866, uh, in May of that year, over in Gurney, which was then the world's biggest financial institution, it was a bill broker or what we'd call a shadow bank, went bust. Okay, The Bank of England, which was notionally the overseer, didn't lend. Uh, there was no lender of the last resort in the financial system then. The central bankers were almost like other banks, but maybe a little bit more important. And out of that crisis and several others, Walter Badgett, who's the doyen of maybe central banking, uh, wrote a book uh, which was called Lombard Street. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in Walter Badgett, read James Grant's book on Badgett. He wrote a biography, brilliant biography uh, about, about Badgett. But Badgett basically came out with a Badgett rule. And the Badgett rule is what central bankers should be thinking of. That means you've got to lend freely to the system at a high rate of interest against good collateral. Now, what are central banks, what have they been doing for the last few years? <laughs> Almost the reverse of that. Lending at low interest rates against, up against poor collateral. And that's not what should be happening. And, you know, this is the mess we've got ourselves in. 
And the whole issue of how do you get out of it? Well, it's not easy. And I just go back to the, you know, the old uh, Irish joke about the lost traveler <laughs> is if you're traveling to Dublin, you don't want to be starting here. <laughs> Can we just, uh, just zoom in on that point about you want to lend at high rates freely, lend freely at high rates against good collateral? What does that mean when the Federal Reserve lends? So uh, the Federal Reserve raising rates through the Fed funds rate, that's not collateralized, right? And then QE is just, your QT is just buying or selling. It's not lending. So Joseph, I want to bring you in. What, in what way does the Federal Reserve lend against collateral? I guess that's repo, reverse repo. And then in what way uh, is the is the collateral shaky? Because it's not as if the Federal Reserve is lending against, you know, CLOs or anything. Yeah, so so that idea, Bezos' idea, goes back to the central bank as a lender of last resort. And that's really what the Fed was originally all about. So before the Fed's founding, the banking system often will get into these panics. So So... People would come and ask the bank for money, and, and the bank would run out of money, and everyone would panic, and the bank would fail. So they came up with the idea of a Federal Reserve as being able to lend to the bank in case they you know, had these liquidity problems. And that's called the discount window. And so what would happen is if you are a bank and you were having liquidity problems, you could call up the Fed and take uh, go to the discount window, and you'd have a folder full of loans that you have on your balance sheet, and you would ask for a loan against this collateral. The collateral is not going to be risk-free. Um, in fact, the discount window accepts a very wide, wide range of collateral. Um, basically anything, and the Fed will look it over and um, lend it at a discount. So let's say you have uh, $100 worth of a corporate loan. Maybe the Fed would give you $0.90 cents on that. And so it would be, it'd be uh, at a rate that's slightly above Fed funds. So that, that's really how, how it works. In, in practice, it's not as often used anymore. Uh, the reason is because, um, like, the Fed has flooded the system with so much liquidity that the banks almost never have any liquidity problems. So, so I guess this is another way to think about Michael's quantity issue, right? It, it really does solve a lot of the problems that we, the banking system used to have. Um, I would also take it into another way. So just as Michael noted, in the capital markets, it's often a refinancing mechanism. The new issue, the net issuance that grows every day is, is not that much. But what most of it is, is just the same companies, the same people just rolling over their current debt. Now, if you've been following us for a while, then you know that at a high level, money can come from a commercial bank or it can come from the government, right? So um, when you are refinancing something, you need someone to have money to lend it to you. You need basically like a bank deposit. And you can have that coming out of a bank so a bank can actually make the loan. Or if the money has already been created by the Fed, then someone else reallocates that bank deposit that's already been created. So basically through a capital markets transaction, like if you're a hedge fund or something like that, taking your money and, and lending it to a corporation. Um, that's, uh, that's another way that this liquidity can move. And if you're doing QT, you're, you're kind of shrieking away that second part of the money supply. So that, again, it's, it's a tightening condition. So where quantities come into play, and it's not just about price, as, was, as Michael noted. I think, you know, I mean, there's a way to see this is to look at data. And uh, there's some charts you, you can take a look at, Jack, that I think I, I winged over. But, you know, one of those, which I think is around slide eight, is looking at uh, global liquidity, and it looks again. It looks at the growth in global liquidity, uh, and it compares that to the growth in asset markets uh, worldwide. And you can see the correlation is, uh, you know, eye-wateringly close. So what this is saying is that all asset markets, whether it be uh, equities, whether it's fixed income, whether it's real estate, uh, you know, whether it's crypto, are all driven. By this concept of liquidity, the amount of you know the amount of money in financial markets clearly governs what you can buy, and that's you know that gives you a, a pretty decent heads up. What's the uh, the interesting point is that that correlation has actually tightened uh, over the course of the last decade. So it was about uh, you know correlation coefficient of about 0.6. Now it's it's over 0.8. So what you've got is uh, a tightening of correlations. Now the other way to, to look at this, and I know this is a concept that that uh, that uh, Joseph's also uh, had has got strong opinions about in terms of the future Fed balance sheet, is if you look at uh, a following slide, I think it's maybe a, a slide, slide uh, 15. What this is looking at is net liquidity injections by the Federal Reserve into U.S. money markets. Now the point that we make here uh, is that the Fed balance sheet per se 
the reported fat balance sheet is not really what you want to be looking at. Uh, it's important, but you want to be thinking about the effective balance sheet. In other words, how much liquidity the Federal Reserve puts into uh, US money markets. And that's what the, uh, the red line is basically indicating. These are the sizes or the size of the, those liquidity injections. Now, you'll see on that same chart, we've put the S&P 500. And what you can see is the tracking between the two is pretty close, particularly recently. Uh, the gyrations in Fed liquidity injections have pretty much led to similar gyrations in the market. Now, the point that we've got to make here and we've got to stress is that if, if the Federal Reserve is realistic about what it intends to do with the balance sheet and take a look at the estimates that the New York Fed have, or projections the New York Fed has put in for the next few years, which is uh, came out of its document on open market operations for 2021, they included in that projections. What you're looking at is a sizable drop in something called SOMA, which is, as Joseph will, will clarify, is the system open market account. Now, that's the amount of treasuries that the Federal Reserve holds. Now, as an interesting aside, those of you who are sci-fi fans will know that SOMA, uh, <laughs> the drug that was uh, in Brave New World, the book by Aldous Huxley, uh, and it was the feel-good drug that everybody basically had. Well, SOMA in the Fed context is the feel-good drug, the monetary drug. And somebody at the Federal Reserve at some stage, uh, when they named SOMA SOMA, must have had a great sense of humor because it, <laughs> it, it basically is there. Now, the SOMA account is dropping from uh, – slated to drop from o over $8 trillion to basically under $6 trillion uh, over the next three or four years, okay? That's a big, big drop. But then you've also got to take into account what's happening to the Treasury General account and also reverse repos. I know Joseph has opined on this as well, but you know our view is that you've got potentially on top of the drop in Treasuries, you've also got reverse repos which could uh, move up simply because if rates start to rise, which they clearly are in the U.S., uh, money market rates will rise at a faster rate than bank deposit rates. So you're going to get a lot of demand for reverse repos from the Fed, from the money funds. Do you think that's right, Joseph? I think that's absolutely right. I think there's a risk that the RRP can actually go to $3 trillion by the end of the year. There, there's, there's a lot of things happening in that space. I mean, one, it's that there's just not a lot of um, money market investments yielding above the RRP. So a lot of money funds are just piling into the RRP right now as we speak. And the other is, as you noted, there's going to be people moving out of their checking account, which is going to give them zero, to a money fund account, especially if the Fed hikes, let's say, 3% by the end of the year. So that's going to suck a lot of liquidity into the RRP. It's going to, it could be a very big number. Yeah. And if, you, you know, if you're a, a, a monetarist and you look at M2, what you're, what, what is, what could easily happen here is that actually M2 contracts in absolute terms, because you're going to get disintermediation out of the banking system uh, into money funds. I mean, that's that's not impossible. So I think that one's got to be cognizant of some of these risks, uh, and the banks will be if the banks are lending at the pace they're currently lending, and inflation is clearly encouraging them to or encouraging demand for loans. Um, where are they going to get their funding from? So you've got potentially, th this is the building up to what could be potentially a Federal Reserve mistake. Now, if you go back to the, uh, the previous slide, Jack, which was looking at that, uh, uh, that uh, chart of the S&P with Fed liquidity injections, and you just do, you know, simple eyeballing of, uh, of uh, what's going on in that data. What it basically says is that if the Federal Reserve is correct in its intention, to take two trillion out of the balance sheet, let's say that uh, on my right-hand axis you get two trillion out of net liquidity injections, and you eyeball what the S and P would be. The answer is about three thousand two hundred, right? If you take Joseph's projection and you say, "Well, we're going to lose another eight hundred uh, billion to a trillion uh, of extra money sucked out because of the of reverse repos." You're talking about 2,500 on the S&P. Now, these are eye-watering numbers. We've got to be, you know, these are the risks and equities. And I don't think the market's fully got there yet. And what's more, we've said nothing at the moment about the real economy.
Uh, just, just as a question, so Michael, in your indicators, have we ever seen a, a tightening this rapid, or at least like the velocity and, and the level? I mean, is, is this something that has happened before? Like the level, both the speed at which it changed and the level we've fallen to? This is, this is pretty rapid. I mean, if you look at the impact uh, that you're getting just on just to take U.S. bank reserves as an example, uh, this tightening is, I mean, we've lost a trillion out of bank reserves, as you know, since the end of last year, uh, which <laughs> against the background where the Federal Reserve supposedly is not doing QT yet is remarkable. But what that tells us is they are doing QT, but it's a secret one. Uh, it's, it's beneath the surface. And sorry, Michael, that, that beneath the surface QT is reverse repo? Yeah, yeah, because that reverse repo is, is going on. Uh, or the Treasury General account is moving. But effectively, it's it's other factors. It's not the SOMA account. The SOMA account uh, is, you know, it's drifting lower, but it's certainly not uh, plunging to the extent of by a trillion, by a trillion dollars. So, so what you've got is a tightening, which on paper is about five times faster than we've seen before. Now, that may be overly dramatic, but there's uh, a chart, I think, that in the pack about slide 15, which looks at uh, the immediate pr or the previous uh, tightening or a previous tightening yes. in the Y2K period. Now, what that what that shows is that actually we're tracking uh, pretty similar to that one. Um, you know, the gradient recently has been uh, has been maybe sharper. So you look at this chart and basically what that what that shows is the yellow line is the current cycle. Um, and you can add a little bit to that where, where uh, current data is basically around 40. So it's got a little bit uh, a little bit lower to drop, uh, you know, on the chart. This chart's a little, you know, month out of date, but we're getting there. And if you look at that timeline, uh, that timeline is basically shown uh, in the Y2K crisis. Now, where you've got a uh, signal there, 2000, uh, 2001, what that basically says is think of that as the turn of 2023. So what you're going to, what you could easily be seeing there is a very sharp uh, rebound in the yellow line when it gets there. But you know, <laughs> traveling uh, is uh, is worse than arriving in many cases, and so you're going to have six months of pain while that yellow line goes down, and then there's maybe a sharp rebound. Now, one of the things that you will see if you look at a track of the S&P is that the S&P goes up, not as the Federal Reserve is turning, as the super tanker changes. It's when it starts to speed up. In other words, when you get that sharp uplift in the yellow or the red line on the chart, that's when you tend to get uh, some of the biggest moves in the market. So in other words, it may we may be thinking about Q2 of 2023 before there's a meaningful jump in the markets. Now, where the position prior to that, I think you've got to go in the front end of the treasury curve and maybe, I say maybe, uh, start to put a toe in the water at the back end. Now, that judgment uh, really depends on where uh, inflation settles and what the underlying level of inflation is and maybe some of the global backdrop. I mean, what happens in Europe, for example, uh, maybe even what happens in Japan, because I think there's two other ugly scenarios that we can go into that sort of uh, also will affect U.S. markets or global markets. Could, could we just zoom out a little bit, Joseph? Could you speak to the Federal Reserve's appetite to uh, moderate inflation, get back to its 2% inflation goal or, or close to that? And what is it willing to sacrifice in order to get there? You know, historically, a shoot up in high yield credit spreads or a freezing of the credit spreads or a sharp 20% decrease in the S&P 500 was enough for a Fed pivot. But is the uh, bar for a pivot much higher now, given that inflation is so high? I think the Federal Reserve is very serious about inflation. I mean, you had Biden invite Chair Powell to the White House, sit him down and talk to inflation. So, you know, I, I think he has the political cover to do whatever it takes, and that includes crashing the stock market. So I, I imagine that's what they'll do. Um, you know, the, the Fed cares about the mechanics of the financial system. So they want the markets to function. That means, so let's say, orderly buying and selling, or do you want to make sure the corporations can be able to refinance their debt, right? That's how uh, the financial system impacts the real economy. A corporation needs to have borrow money on a short-term basis to make payroll and things like that. So, um, 
as long as those things function, that's fine. Equities, it, it really kind of doesn't really matter too much into the mechanics of the real economy. In the sense that it does go down a lot, it actually helps the Fed because, you know, you tamp down on animal spirits, maybe people buy less stuff, maybe that will help in inflation a little bit, basically decreasing demand. So mm. um, I suspect that, uh, you know, the Chair Powell has enormous resolve and he's going to slowly massage the market towards a higher rate path. That word slower is, is something I'd love to zoom in on because I recently was speaking to an expert in volatility and I asked, why is the VIX only at 23, 24 if we've had these vicious sell-offs? And the matter of the fact is on an index S&P 500 level, they have been vicious only on the one month, two month scale, but not on the one day scale. So you haven't had that huge spike in daily realized volatility. Of course, Nirvana, excuse me, Carvana and Netflix, not Nirvana, uh, Carvana, <laughs> Netflix, Snowflake, all sorts of these stocks have, have really had a very tough time. But on the equity level, S&P 500, you haven't had a huge spike in realized volatility. And as a result, the VIX hasn't spiked uh, uh, as well. My question for both of you is, do you think that this sort of orderly annihilation of the markets where the S&P 500 goes down maybe 1% a week is preferable to a, 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 a dramatic sell-off that, that really uh, could start a, a market panic? Um, because Michael, I know you've done a lot of, of correlations to how when liquidity recedes, the VIX spikes. But do you think there's a scenario in which we could have a, a huge sell-off over the course of a year, but the VIX doesn't spike because it's it's a pretty sort of an, an orderly uh, sell-off. So uh, yeah, Joseph, how about we start with you? Do, do you think the, the Fed prefers what we have now where it's a very gentle sell-off as opposed to a, a, a true panic? No, you're absolutely right, Jack. I, as, you, as you suggested, I think this is much smoother for, for everyone, actually, just have a orderly demolition of risk assets. It's bad if you own puts, but for everyone else, I think it, it's much preferable because when you have these big volatile moves, something somewhere could break. And so you, you don't really know where. It's a really complicated system. Eventually someone, for example, could get wiped out, get margin calls, forcing other people to get margin calls. So having this slow motion thing, I think allows the Fed to be more comfortable having asset levels go lower. So for example, if we were to go to 3000, it'd be much better if we did that over a few months than if we did that over two days, right? If we did that over two days, then we'd have QE the next day. <laughs> but, but the way that we're, we're doing this, we could, we could do it. We could, I guess, more effectively accomplish the Fed's task of tightening financial conditions. Yeah, I think that makes absolute sense. I mean, if you, if you look at what drives the VIX, uh, in our estimation, it's really driven by, by two sets of factors. One is volatility in other markets. Uh, I mean, way back when I was at Salmon Brothers, we did a lot of work on the sequencing of volatil volatility. And what you found was that volatility tended to begin in the fixed income or the Forex markets, and then it migrated into the equity markets. So it was a little bit like squeezing a balloon and it would bulge somewhere else. So what you would get is that transmission. So I think that's one thing to think about. And you've started to see that sequencing. You've got high volatility in the move index in fixed income. You're starting to get more vol in the in the currency markets, and then ultimately it's going to start to come out in the equity market. But the real trigger for VIX equity market vol is a recession. And that's, I think, the thing we need to focus on, you know, is a recession coming? Now, if you look at uh, a lot of the leading indicator data that we look at, I mean, we're absolutely convinced it's coming. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, if you take a global view, uh, our numbers tell us that Asia is already in recession. Uh, you know, courtesy of maybe to a large extent China here, uh, but it's in recession. Europe is just entering recession, and the U.S. is probably a month or two behind that. So uh, the U.S. is coming. But you know, look at some of the you know the recent earnings numbers or uh, earnings reports coming out of Walmart or Target. I mean, they're showing whopping great increases in inventory, 30, 30 to forty percent jumps. I mean, this is not a happy situation, and so it's bound to be translating. Uh, into a slower economy. And a lot of the leading indicators, even you know, looking at the, at the uh, Michigan Consumer Survey, I mean, these are really, really ugly numbers. Uh, so I'd be really concerned about a recession upcoming. But the Fed's focus is very much now on getting inflation down. And the issue is, is not so much, the, the wrong question, I think, is to say whether inflation is peaking and who knows on the, on the Friday print, uh, are we going to see a peak or not? I think that's that's a sort of flip of a coin. There are arguments for and against. But the main point is, what's the persistence of inflation? 
And we do calculations which look at the spillover from month to month of the inflation numbers for the US. And you're looking at persistence levels, which are, which are sort of up at the late 1970s uh, rate. So what does that mean? It basically means that for every one percentage change in monthly US inflation, you get a spillover currently of about uh, 0.8 percent the next month and then 0.6 percent the month afterwards. So it's a huge amount of persistence. The last time you saw that degree of persistence, you basically saw Volcker in the Fed. Now, what was the result of, of Volcker? Well, we know that sky high interest rates and two recessions in three years. Now, is Jay Powell a Volcker? I don't think so, but I think that he's, you know, treading that path. So I think they're going to they're going to focus on uh, getting inflation down and concentrating now on uh, on tightening over the next six months pretty aggressively. Michael, do you think that since they're also doing QT right now, that maybe that moderates the amount of interest rate hikes they have to do? So maybe he won't have to go full Volcker because he's also withdrawing liquidity at such a rapid rate, as your indicators suggest. Yeah, I think that I think that's possible. I mean, you know, my reading of the of the fixed income markets uh, is that you know the current uh, terminal Fed funds rate that's implied by the forward curve is around about three point six percent, and I would be surprised if the Fed can get up to those levels. I think that probably my view would be about three percent is a maximum. Um, Give I don't think the economy can take you know anything much more than that. Joseph, we I can put up a chart that Michael had before of the Fed and the ECB's projections of their own balance sheets showing quantitative tightening and reduction in their balance sheets out until 2025. Uh, my question for you is how realistic do you think that is? And also, do you think that the $95 billion you know, maximum roll-off that the Fed aims to get to within three months will be sufficient to, to drain um, – uh, to, to, to moderate inflation. I mean, you know, how much did the Fed balance sheet go up during March and April of 2020? A lot more than 95 billion. You know, is it going to take is it going to take that level of drastic action to to moderate inflation? So the Fed has this projection where they're going to withdraw about a trillion dollars a year in their in, in their from shrink through a balance sheet by a trillion dollars a year. So Chair Powell has noted that he suggests this will continue for about three years. I, I'm pretty sure that something will break bef- before then. So I don't actually consider to this to be realistic. Um, well, to be fair, basically all economic projections are not not very realistic. So something will break maybe within a year, maybe within two. So I, I, I think that eventually we'll start growing their balance sheet again. Um, I haven't seen the ECB projections, but I suspect that they'll never be able to shrink their balance sheet. I mean, they're too worried about what happens when, uh, let's say, periphery spreads blow up. So, no, this is, I think this is silly. Uh, they're, they're <laughs> never be able to shrink their balance sheet. I don't know. Michael, you probably study this a bit more. So, Yeah, well, those are actually projections that, that we've made based on statements or, uh, or, or policy prescriptions that are already slated by the ECB. So this is, uh, uh, this is what they're ultimately planning. Uh, and I kind of, you know, I kind of think I think the I agree with you here that you've got you've got this problem. But, you know, the the sort of the deeper issue, which, you know, I think every uh, CIO has got to start thinking about is are the central banks here for the long term? I mean, my, my answer is absolutely yes. But we've been saying this for a decade or more. Uh, they're in this game for the in the long term. And you just got to see that it's stated. It's it's basically policy. Look at the. Uh, uh, the report I foreshadowed earlier on, which is the report that, on open market operations by the New York Fed, which is in the public domain. Uh, what they're saying is the balance sheet shrinks. And what that basically shows is a drop from eight trillion to six, but then up to seven trillion by the by 2030. So you've still got a balance sheet potentially of the of the of Fed balance sheet, which you add a little bit more for other factors. You're talking about eight trillion again by 2030. So the central banks are in this game long, long term. That matters for asset allocation. And you know, people have got to start thinking about what are the asset classes that you need to hold in an environment where central banks are the major players or aim or continue to be major players in markets. And I would have thought logically that crypto or gold has got to be some have have some place in long term portfolios under that uh, under that regime. And it's not just the Fed. It's ECB too. They're in a worse situation. 
Let's not even go to Japan. <laughs> Their balance sheet is going to the moon. <laughs> But, but you know, so I agree with you, especially with respect to gold, but it doesn't seem like the gold is, you know, responding to, to what we see right, right now, though. I mean, we see the central banks are just basically going to be there forever and grow larger and larger in their presence, but the gold prices don't, don't seem to go anywhere. They, they seem to just kind of fall. I mean, do you think the market hasn't woken up yet, or do you think this is just due to the strong, strong dollar, or just, just a timing issue then? Well, I think that the I think the issue is a, is a timing issue. I mean, we we do analysis which basically uh, combines, if you like, assets that respond to monetary inflation, of which you would say gold and crypto are the are the sort of predominant ones. And the movements in gold and crypto combined as a universe actually match the gyrations in liquidity pretty much one for one. So uh, you know the the fact that gold didn't go up when liquidity was expanding meant that most of the impetus was actually shoveled into the crypto market. But you average the two out, and actually it looks pretty reasonable. So maybe the gold flatlines, and everything is taken in crypto now. That's fascinating. Michael, you wrote that you think now the Federal Reserve is essentially three times as powerful as it was in 2008. Could you just uh, share what you mean by that? And then I want to get Joseph's take because, you know, Joseph, there are folks who say that the Federal Reserve essentially is just a puppeteer. He doesn't have any real power. And I know you have some perhaps conflicting views with that. Yeah, I think the I think the issue is, is that, you know, let, let's just summarize our view of Federal Reserve policy. Uh, which is to get the balance sheet down and get the dollar up, okay? Or let's say Fed and Treasury policy. And I think what you've got to think about is that ultimately, you know, what's what's really important in the world uh, is liquidity and global, okay? We're living in a global world, an interconnected world. And that's why we focus on that concept, global liquidity. Now, economic power is about the ability to move capital around and hence uh, currency and credit are really important. So the dollar credit system is paramount within the world system. Now, there's a lot of debate, uh, which we know, which goes on about, is this Bretton Woods 3 or if it's Bretton Woods 2? It's, it's nonsense, okay? <laughs> Bretton Woods 1 never went away, okay? What was Bretton Woods 1? It was all about the dominance of the dollar. It was basically setting up uh, a system with the dollar at the heart of the system, which could move trade flows and capital flows around the world, or more specifically, around the free world. It excluded China and excluded the Soviet bloc at that stage. OK, you had the uh, IMF and the World Bank to police that. And you happen to have as a corollary a fixed uh, exchange rate system. We've got rid of the fixed exchange rate bit, but everything else remains. And the dollar is still at the heart of the system. In fact, it's become more and more important. Now, I think that one of the most or the critical speeches that everyone's got to pay attention to is the speech that Janet Yellen made in April of this year to the Atlantic Council, and it was called Friendshoring. And you read that speech, and what this is about is how the world is going to work. Uh, and the world works that effectively uh, you you are either a friend of America or you're a foe of America. If you're a friend, you get access to dollars. Dollars are critical. If you're a foe, wave goodbye. You don't get access. And that's what's going to focus everyone's mind. And you're going to get a cleaving of the world financial system to two bits, one controlled by the US and a nascent one, which the Chinese are trying to build. The Chinese have got ambitions. They've very, got very clear ambitions. In the book Capital Wars, we go through what their pathway is. But ultimately, what they're trying to do is to challenge the dollar system. Hence, China is setting up equivalent swap lines around the world uh, to try and you know, lure people into the yuan system. But right now, and this is the, the, you know, the geopolitical angle one's got to think about, and it may be that you know, we're way, way off here in our views, but there is one of the things I learned when I was at Salomon Brothers, the very first lesson was there is no unconnected event. And that's what the traders used to keep saying time and time again. And the point is, look at the yen, right? The yen has devalued over 40 trading days at an annualized rate of 83%, right? Markets never do that to big currencies. Only governments do. So somebody is shaking that tree. And what you've had for the last five or six years across the Asian markets is something that many people refer to as the Shanghai Accord, which came out of the Shanghai G20 meeting in the spring of 2016. 
And that was an attempt to get the dollar, then strong dollar down. And basically what happened is the currencies virtually were static across rates in Asia. There was no currency volatility. There was a de facto Asian euro, hate to use that word, de facto Asian euro, which was basically created. What you've had in the last uh, eight to 10 weeks is that has been broken. Currency volatility in Asia has leapt higher and someone's shaking that tree. The yen is a Trojan horse and the corollary of all that is that China is being forced right now to tighten liquidity. We haven't spoken about the Chinese central bank, yes. but the other central bank that's really important is the People's Bank of China. And in April and May, they're normally big months for the People's Bank to inject liquidity into the financial system in China. That's the seasonal pattern. What do they do for the last two months, April and May? They've taken 800 billion RMB yuan out of the system, 120 billion bucks. That's big money. And they're tightening Why? Liquidity. Why are they doing that if their economy is already in recession, if you look at you know manufacturing PMIs? And then also, how does the Bank of Japan? Yeah. It's to try and stop the yuan devaluing through seven. And as I said, someone's shaking the tree. So you've got one big problem there. Now, let me get back to answer your question. Why is the Fed three to four times uh, more important? It's because of Basel III regulations, factors like that, which are constrained banks in terms of their ability to lend, the importance of basically going to the Fed, uh, getting access to the repo, uh, the standing repo facility. Uh, it's things like the tax control of the euro dollar markets back about five years ago under Trump, uh, where money was repatriated back to the US. It's also the FX swap market. I mean, these are factors which are absolutely critical. And the Federal Reserve is basically, you know, turning the dial here. Do you agree, Joseph? Is the Federal Reserve to have the reins? No, absolutely. I think that, oh, well, so they definitely have a lot more power. So if you think back to earlier in our discussion, Fed at, in the beginning was a lender of last resort for banks. And that lender of last resort role has been expanding to basically almost everyone now. So if you think back during the GFC, it expanded its role to lender of last resort to the euro dollar system through its FX swaps, as, as Mike noted. And it also expanded its lender of last resort to the dealers and the money market funds. Um, and uh, to basically shut out banking sector back. Now, if you think back what happened in March 2020, they further extended their lender of last resort role to include corporations, right? There's a, uh, there was a corporate credit facility. And also the Fed tried to make become lender of last resort to, to businesses and individuals through um, their PPP loan facility, which is basically working with the government asking banks to make loans to small businesses and people, and the Fed would provide liquidity for that. Now, the Fed doesn't actually have the infrastructure to directly give money to people individually, so they have to work through the banking system. And that's, that's the one aspect in their lender of last resort roles. But there's another aspect that they've become a lot more influential as well, and that's through the regulatory aspect. And as Michael Lord noted, Basel III greatly expanded the regulatory powers of the central banks. And now we seem to be moving towards a world where the Fed may be able to, I guess, suggest to banks that they have to do certain kinds of lending. For example, you want, we want, maybe perhaps they want a bank to make green loans to support green infrastructure, right? So they, they seem to be pushing towards that model. And to be clear, that's a model that that's, it's not uncommon. If you think back, um, let's say uh, 30 years ago in, in Japan and much of uh, Southeast Asia, the central banks operated like that. They would basically direct uh, their domestic banks to lend to certain key industries. So it seems like we're moving towards that kind of industry as well. So the Fed is basically becoming uh, much, much more important, both in the financial and the real economy. And I'm not even sure that's a good thing, because as we all know, central bankers, you know, they don't stand for elections. And if you work there, you can never be fired. So you, you don't really know if um, they're making good decisions. And if they aren't, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Joseph, what about Absolutely. the federal? So they can, you know, they they've reined in the euro dollar system, uh, according to you both. They have, you know, essentially complete control over the reserves, which they can, you know, control with the the wave of their magic QE wands, QT wands. What about the commercial banking system, which is extremely important for inflation? You know, after the in, in the wake of the great financial crisis, bank lending, commercial bank lending to to real people like the three of us, to businesses was muted even though you know quantitative easing cannot force banks to lend even though it, it does can force you know an explosion of um 
of reserves, which can lead to an explosion of deposits, but those deposits are not loans. They are deposits from banks buying treasuries, mortgage-backed securities from, from their own customers. So in what way, you know, if before this whole inflationary disaster uh, happened, the Fed couldn't stimulate bank lending, can the can the Fed uh, not be able to moderate bank lending? And what if what if we have a out of control? You know, banks are lending way too much money in 2022, 2023, and the Federal Reserve does not have control of that. Joseph. Well, that's 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 the next phase of this. It's the CBDC. It's a new toolkit for the Fed to be so that they can do things like this. Now, this idea it's actually out in the open. So. Uh, if you recall, uh, last year, Saul Amarova, which is a professor in law, was nominated to be the t- one of the top bank regulators uh, in the U.S. And she has a paper, and she talks about how she thinks the economy could operate. That is, in her view, basically, the Fed makes loans, and you know, the Fed kind of determines who gets money and who doesn't. It's an one. It's a basically further expansion of the Fed's power. Now. We, we're, we're not there yet, or we're still building the technology. But to me, the trajectory, if you look past the tw- past 20 years, across financial markets, across regulation, this is, I think, what a many in the Fed and no, a certain faction in the, in, the, in the politics want or want the Fed to move towards. And um, it's already happening in other countries. If you notice, that CBDCs are most popular in countries that have uh, basically authoritarian in structure like uh, like China, so it it seems that we we might eventually drift towards a world where the Fed could solve the problems you mentioned, Jack. We just have you know call up Jay Powell and he'll give uh, his friends money. So yeah, you- gonna make sure you have to be friends with the politicians. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm friends with you, Joseph. Um, so that's a long, ter- that's a long term view. But what about 2022, 2023? You know, CBDCs, the Fed, Fed coin, is not likely coming within the next two years. So I'm just going to put up a chart from your excellent report um, on FedGuy.com, which shows bank credit creation. And you write that unless credit creation in 2022 rivals the historic growth seen last year, bank deposits looks at for the first annual decline since the early 90s, which sounds deflationary. But that uh, decline from de- in bank deposits is due to quantitative tightening and the reverse repo facility, not credit creation. And as we know, credit creation is the you know the the sort of the the big player when it comes to inflationary money creation because it's creating you know it's alchemy it's creating money from nothing so what if this blue line continues to spike higher and the, you know the Federal Reserve you know it, it doesn't have a, a, an ability to stop bank lending right I mean it, it what what you know what happens if inflation goes to 10 11 12 percent because of this I think that's an interesting question uh, bank credit creation is really strong so at least some so segments in the economy. Um, you know, they're doing okay, at least well enough to continue to borrow. And we're in an inflationary environment. Everything costs more, and everything costs more. You're going to need to borrow more money to buy the same things that you used to buy. So it's it's going to be a good, an interesting, it's definitely something to watch because we do seem to be going into a slowing economy, maybe a recession later on if that's that happens. And you'd expect credit creation to slow down as well. Uh, so far, don't see that. But, um, uh, you know, storm clouds seem to be gathering. Yeah, I mean, it could be the case that you get an acceleration in, in loans in the near term if there is a recession, because corporations will just draw down, uh, you know, pre- predetermined, uh, you know, loan loan uh, credit lines uh, when they need them, and I think that's feasible. the The issue I I would you know, bring up is how do how do banks fund their balance sheets and that lending in an environment where deposits are shrinking and the money markets are tightening hugely? I mean, the, these are these are problems that banks have got to face. Uh, and therefore, you know, we've got a, a bigger problem out there to face, a Fed accident. That's a great transition to the one topic where you gentlemen have slightly different uh, views, which is on the value and future prospect of duration, long-term treasuries. Michael, uh, you know, I think you have the view that treasuries are close to being a buy here because of the slowing economy, whereas, Joseph, you think that quantitative tightening as well as the prospect of sustained inflation make treasuries uh, not a buy yet. So, Michael, how about you share your view first, and then we get your view, Joseph. I think that you know, what, what I would say is that um, th- there are a number of moving parts one's got to look at. I mean, one is, what is the underlying level of inflation that the, that the system will essentially converge to. Uh, my view is that it likely is not a lot different from what we saw pre-COVID. So I would say that maybe in the US, we're talking about somewhere between 2 and 3% probably underlying inflation. My view is that that's largely demographically driven. 
uh, you know, basically uh, an aging society, as all the West is, is basically low inflation. I, I just don't buy the argument, the other argument which many people cite. I think it's deflationary in Japan showed that. Uh, but I think it takes some time to get there, okay, to get back to that level because of the persistence of inflation. Now, my view is that the bond market will price that. They'll look through any near-term surge, and you will not get such a hike uh, or a necessary hike at the front end. Consequently, I would say that maybe 3% is probably the level that Fed funds can go to. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll come quietly and maybe accept a little bit more, a tad more, but at that sort of level. Now, if you look at the, at the opportunities for the back end for 10-year um, for treasuries, that's really driven by term premia. And term premia uh, are, you know, a, a factor that are really very negative, but I think they could go a lot more negative. And one of the things that both fixed income and equity investors have got to think about is that equities never rally until there's been a subsequent or previous surge in the fixed income markets. Fixed incomes, 10-year bonds have got to move uh, price-wise up significantly before equities begin to turn. And in other words, what you're going to see is a drop in long yields at some stage. Now, I think that's a recession-driven event. So I'll just give my side and, you know, that's what makes the market. So I, I could be wrong. So I, I think of ultimately the fundamental for any asset prices is just supply and demand. And if you look at the supply side of, of treasuries coming online in the next few years and the demand side, it's, it's actually very stark. So... Uh, if you count for QT, the supply in treasuries the next few years is going to be 1.5 trillion each, and that's a lot for the market to handle. Especially as as we've noted, market liquidity is, is not very good, and so when you don't have very good liquidity, you can have large price moves with just with just small volumes. On on the buying side, you you'll note that over the past few years we've had different sets of marginal buyers. So pre-COVID, it was the hedge funds, and they bought you know let's say. Uh, a lot. So compared to now, compared to then, they've kind of taken down their exposure by almost a trillion dollars. So they were buying a lot of treasuries, part of their cash futures basis trades. Post 2020, it was the Fed and the commercial banks, Fed doing QE, commercial banks, you know, picking their QE cash to work. And now all of that, it's going away. So um, you're going to have a new buyer. I don't know who it is yet. The foreigners aren't going to step in because when the foreigners buy, they have to FX hedge it, and when you FX hedge it, it's uh, based on front end rates, and front end rates are going higher, so it's not going to be worth it for them. So we're going to have to have a new buyer come in, and it's it's not clear who that is. So there's going to be a phase of price discovery that probably be volatile and probably be much higher, because if you know the marginal buyers in the past, the hedge funds, they're buying as part of a spreadsheet. They don't actually care about the. Uh, the where the yields are by themselves. Fed doesn't care, and commercial banks, they, they're regulatory driven. And foreign banks, they're partially regulatory driven, and in part uh, because of what they have at home, it's just negative rates. So uh, if you if you want to move to people who are more fundamental driven, fundamental driven, you you actually need people who, who need higher returns. And so that's why I think that rates will go higher, and maybe significantly so. And so I'll just present the case for um, Dem aging demographics being inflationary. That's originally from Charles Goodhart of, of the Bank of England. Uh, um, I, I used to think that demograph aging demographics was deflationary as well, and that's kind of what I hear most of the time. But this idea of aging demographics being inflationary, I think it's super interesting. And basically what it's saying is that when you have aging demographics, you have lower supply of labor. And if you increase, decrease the supply of labor, you're going to get higher prices uh, because wages go higher. Um, one way to think about this is, let's say you're retired. Okay, so tomorrow you're 60 years old. You don't work anymore, right? Okay, so you're no longer producing goods and services in, into the economy. However, you continue to consume. You continue to, I don't know, if you're a boomer, maybe you have a yacht somewhere and you're just kind of living, living the high life. So you continue to buy stuff, right? So maintaining demand of goods and services, reduce supply, that's higher prices. So people often point to Japan as the quintessential example of how aging demographics can be deflationary, and that, that is a puzzle. But I think one thing to note, and what, what people who hold this view hold, is that um, in a globalized world, labor is a global pool. So even though Japan itself was aging, when it was going through that phase, um, the, 
globally, uh, there, was, there was still enormous supply of labor from China and from, let's say, the developing world, right? So what's changing as we go forward is that China is also aging tremendously and very quickly. In fact, um, you know, they're just because of their one-child policy and so forth, uh, they, they're, they're just going to be aged much faster than, than everyone else. So you're going to have a world with more people who are buying, consuming, and less fewer people working. So structurally, that seems inflationary to me. And not saying that everyone buys bonds based on fundamentals because they don't. But if you do, that's something to keep in mind. But I, I think to argue against myself, I think the other, the other two factors to think about here are what other central banks are doing. Uh, and although... You know, we we dismissed um, the Bank of Japan and or I did the and the ECB. I think they do have some role in the bond markets, and the the reason for saying that is that uh, bonds tend to correlate together much much more than equity markets do. Uh, anyway, traditionally they have done, and the fact is that if um, the ECB uh, loses the battle on inflation, which it looks like it's doing rapidly. Uh, you know what's going to happen to the bund, I and mean, the bund, the charts on the bund don't look great right now, and that's one of the things that could feed back into the treasury market. And the other is just you know look at the devaluation of the yen. I mean we've had a big one already, but it continues to devalue as we speak. And you know if it can't if it can't keep going, it won't. And at some stage the Japanese are going to you know reality is going to hit, and they're going to have to tighten policy, and that is going to be a, a you know an earth shaking move. Uh, if they start to do that. So we may get pressure on the long end of the bond markets through those two shocks. And we, you know, we shouldn't dismiss that. So I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd put a toe in the water at the long end of the market, but, you know, I'd be much yeah. more comfortable with the front end. I, I think that's a really good point about Japan, Michael. I mean, like you mentioned, the rate of depreciation that the yen is doing, it's historic and they can't go on forever. Sooner or later, the BOJ is going to have to do something. And what they'll do is probably relax the boundaries for yield curve control. Mm -hmm. So maybe they'll let the 10-year the go, go to 50 basis points or something like that. That's going to be a sudden shock throughout the global bond markets. And, you know, it's, it's going to be very disruptive because, um, you know, a lot of people will be surprised. It's, you know, for for all for all we know, maybe he'll do a surprise announcement, and people won't be prepared for that. Right. The idea there being that global bond investors look at a German ten-year bund in the same way they look at a German ten-year Treasury yield. They just hedge the FX risk or a ten-year ten Japanese government bond. So if the yield on the the bund goes from zero to three then the 10 year treasury should probably go from two to five or something, something like that. Uh, so you, yeah. both of you expressed a little bit of conservatism about how high the Fed funds rate, the short end can go. My question is, if we look at the, let's say the, the uh, financial conditions index, the Goldman Sachs uh, financial index, which is, you know, in some way related, I'm gonna guess it's in some way correlated to your global liquidity index. It's probably a little more imprecise and it has more motley factors. It's got, you know, the dollar, uh, interest rates, credit spreads, equities, uh, how much of that of of the interest rates can, can continue to go up? And you know, obviously the Federal Reserve has to monetary conditions have to tighten more. So do equities have to go down? Does, does credit spreads have to widen? Um, and and can you specifically speak about why you think perhaps that the the the, the peak is going to be something like three point five percent of the Fed funds rate, and that it, we don't get to something like five percent, which is uh, you know obviously a tail risk scenario. Well, I think, I mean, to answer that question directly, I think that, uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily need the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. Just look at the at the Treasury market. And if you dissect the Treasury market, uh, you know, my interpretation of, of uh, bonds has always been that bonds, basically, there, there are two key moving parts. One is the front end of the curve, which is really about interest rate expectations. So look at something like the one uh, the one year, three year spread or one year, five year spread. That tells you a lot about what the market's pricing in. Uh, for Fed rate hikes. But look at the back end, and that will tell you about term premium. So if you look at the 510 spread, okay, that's really a, a crude measure, but not a bad measure uh, of what the term premium on the bond is. Now, what you've had going on in the markets is you've had a steepening at the front end, a very vicious steepening, and you've had a very vicious flattening at the back end. So it's telling you that rate expectations are going up and term premium are collapsing. And the collapse in term premium is all about uh, changing risk appetite. And it's saying that bond investors do not want to take risk. They want the safety of the safe asset, which is the 10-year bond. Now, basically, what, that, uh, what that's telling us from a corporate point of view 
is that corporations are raising money uh, around about the three to five year area. So number one, their cost of financing has gone up hugely because of the front end rise. And secondly, that the appetite for their debt has collapsed uh, simply because uh, the, of the uh, negative or much more negative term premium. So that configuration, which, you know, at Salomon Brothers, we used to think that uh, a flat yield curve with a big belly around the middle, around the mid duration years was the worst outlook, uh, much worse than an inverted curve. And that's exactly pretty much what we've had now. So what you've got is a curve with um, uh, an, a, a pretty fat belly, which is actually that the chart that you're showing kind of shows that, but it shows that there's a big extension around that middle area. Um, and what you need to look at is to dissect that into the front end movement uh, and the back end movement. And what that is looking at is um, the black line is rate expectations. Um, so that's the uh, the one year forward, 10 years out. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, suggesting terminal Fed funds around three and a half percent. And then you've got the orange line, which is which is term premium. And that is basically a measure of the risk appetite of investors in the fixed income markets. And what you've seen is this big collapse. Now, that uh, pattern where you've got the black line crossing the orange line is what you might call for the credit markets, the, the sort of death cross, uh, because it mm. says that within 12 months, you're going to get a big problem in the credit markets. And typically, um, what you what you see is uh, is is that unfolding credit spreads widen about you know six to twelve months after uh, you get this particular pattern uh, unfolding and there's a chart I think a little bit later it's simply a normalised Z score effect in fact of different credit spreads so it's high yield um, junk so triple C minus single B B minus triple uh, A quality spread B double A minus triple A these sort of things in an index in red. And the yellow line is simply the 10 year minus five year US Treasury yield inverted and advanced by 12 months. Now, what's happening is we're tracking exactly that movement, uh, what, what the yield curve, uh, the Treasury yield curve has been uh, has been suggesting. Yeah, it, it doesn't look good. And, you know, folks may look at a, a high yield index, let's say HYG, and they see, you know, it's down 10% year to date. And they say, oh, my God, look at the credit markets, they're imploding. But actually, the bulk of that sell off has been due to a rise in risk free interest rates, which is the Fed, uh, and not a, a, a widening of credit spreads. But what your chart here shows is that the widening credit spreads, it's coming. Uh, Joseph, your thoughts on two things. Number one, is, do you think the, the widening in credit spreads is coming? Uh, and also, can you just explain from the point of view from the Fed, how do they think about term premium? Do they want term premium to go up now? Do they want to go down and why? Oh, so Jack, just on just on your last point about HYG, there's actually an interest rate hedged version of HYG where you, that hedges out that interest rate so you can more clearly see um, it, whether or not it's because the credit spreads are widening or if it's because of, of interest rates. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know what it but yeah. H Y G A T I yeah so that that would be able to show your point very well so I I think the Fed will definitely cares about term premium and they want it to go wider and that's what Q T is all about so again if you think about Q E as trying to compress term premiums so that everyone will you know shift their portfolios into other assets or take out loans to buy houses and things like that well Q T is the opposite and how does the Fed think that it can expand term premium it's by selling well letting the market digest more treasuries. So that's what they're going to try to do um, over the next uh, next few months. So it, it's QT for treasuries is always a bit strange. I mean, for, for agency MBS, for example, once QT was coming, you know, the market was aware of it, you can see the spread between agencies and 10 years widen pretty significantly. Um, for, for treasuries, it, it hasn't been that much. So um, I'm not really sure if the market is slow or... Um, or what else is happening. But over the coming months, there's going to be a lot more, a lot more treasuries coming on onto the market. So uh, I, I would think that to me, that makes sense that we'd see term premium widen a bit going forward. And I, I'm not, I'm not sure how credit spreads are, uh, will be for going forward. Michael's charts were very, very compelling. So I makes sense to me that they would widen as well. Yes. Well, history is definitely on the side. I mean, that the charts show that clearly, if it were not to happen, it would be 
a departure from from history. Michael, you've got a few more fantastic charts I want to go through. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, it's about good liquidity and bad liquidity, and it's got a sort of a table. And I want I want you and Joseph to explain uh, what's going on here. So, what's good liquidity? What's bad liquidity? And why does it result in changes in FX markets, uh, uh, currencies, as well as yield curve? And where are we now? What have we seen? Okay. Well, the 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 basic idea about this is this is how our our methodology operates and. What we think of is, is in terms of both the quantity of liquidity and the quality mix of liquidity. Now, the reason for looking at this is this is what drives both the Forex markets and the fixed income markets, uh, where we take the yield curve as probably the best measure uh, of the fixed income markets. Effectively, the yield curve is summarizing uh, both rate expectations and, um, uh, and term premium. Now, what that, what that basically is saying is that Good liquidity is liquidity that the private sector is creating. It's good from the perspective of how the market, and particularly the Forex market, views that. So if you have private sector liquidity, let me give you examples of that. So, for example, if you get corporations creating lots of cash or households managing to produce lots of savings, that's cash, that's, that cash generation is probably coming from a vibrant economy. And a vibrant economy will cause the... Uh, currency to strengthen, right? But if the Federal Reserve starts printing money, expanding its balance sheet, that's bad liquidity from a Forex point of view, and the currency will weaken. So what you want to look at from a currency perspective is to subtract Fed liquidity from private sector liquidity creation. And that tells you about how the Forex markets are moving. Now, the traditional ac academic view is not to make that distinction. And what academics do is to lump all that money or liquidity together and start to look at liquidity for the US versus liquidity for Canada or Mexico or Japan or whatever. That's not the right way of doing it. If you do it this way, you get much, much more accurate projections of currencies. So what we're doing is looking at this quality mix and then taking that relative. Now, the other dimension is then to look at what um, drives the fixed income markets, and that's the sum of liquidity. So in other words, it's the pure quantity and not the quality. So if the private sector creates liquidity, <clears throat> it's creating lots of cash. The Federal Reserve creates that cash. Domestically, investors are not too bothered about where it comes from. And if there's lots of liquidity, they can just use that liquidity and they go out down the risk curve, shun government bonds and go into stocks or crypto or commodities or credits. Make sense? I think that's a yes. really good distinction between private and, and public. I mean, if you're private liquidity, you're created by a bank, right? So a bank makes a loan to someone who's going to be able to pay them back. So likely it's, let's say, to an investment that actually is has a chance of being successful and paying the bank back. So you, you it's uh, well allocated, so to speak. But central bank liquidity, ultimately, that's providing money for the government to spend. And, you know, they just kind of you know, give that away to their friends and stuff like special interests or whatnot. So that that's, the, I mean, they don't care if it's well located or not, which is the key difference. So I think that's a really good distinction. Michael, why is the uh, People's Bank of China not stimulating, given that their, their economy is, is close to slash in recession? You said it was because they wanted to protect the value of the yuan. Why is that a strategic priority if China has so many uh, trillions and trillions of, of dollar reserves, treasuries. You know, historically, I don't think of a of a yen depreciation as something that China has has been worried about. I think that you know, if you if you look at um, the evolution of capitalism, uh, what you tend to find is that as capital becomes mature, uh, it wants to export itself. It wants to go international, and you need purchasing power to do that. And effectively, a strong currency gives you that purchasing power. Now, the Chinese basically want the yuan to be used uh, as a vehicle currency and as a savings currency, and a strong yuan will basically enhance that, uh, that situation. Or let me put it more, more you know, or, or maybe in a more anodyne way, they want a stable currency, at least a stable currency. Stability is what the Chinese really look for. Now, I go through this in the book Capital Wars, but basically uh, I start with a quote from uh, a general from the People's Liberation Army that says the goal of the Chinese uh, authorities is to challenge the dollar, okay? They want to get rid of the dollar, particularly within Asia. And the route to do that is basically three paths, in my estimation. It's number one is re-denominating 
Chinese trade in yuan and developing a trade credit system among Chinese banks. Uh, why is that important? Because that's how the dollar got onto the map uh, after World War I. Exactly the same formula. Uh, basically, uh, the dollar kicked out sterling within a very, very short space of time because more and more trade after World War I was in dollars and US banks were allowed to come in by the Fed to transact that. Okay. Number two is they open up their bond markets uh, to foreign money. They're not interested in what the equity market's doing. They're interested in what the bond market's doing. And that's the key thing. And they've already sucked in a lot of money uh, into uh, Chinese government bonds. And that's important. The third thing is to create a digital currency that will allow peer-to-peer -peer transfers. They are what? Who Anyone can estimate five years ahead of America on doing that. Uh, but they're basically doing it. And so what you've got is the uh, you've got the ability of the Chinese now to increasingly challenge uh, the U.S. dollar within Asia. And they're beginning to do more and more trade denominated in yuan. Now, the critical question that people that don't believe this have got to ask is, why is China setting up so many swap lines, yuan swap lines around the Asian region? The only conceivable reason is that those swap lines are there for yuan denominated trade, ultimately. So basically, they're preparing a euro RMB. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the thing. Now, the way to stop that is to start shaking the tree vigorously, in my view, and to basically put pressure on the yuan. And that may be being done, as I said, and it may be a pie in the sky view by the yen as a Trojan horse, because it starts to break that uh, stability. And it puts a lot of pressure on China, given the integration of the Japanese economy with China. Look at the one Korean one that's also devalued uh, recently in line with what the yen has been doing. So a lot of pressure is being heaped on the yuan and it's weakening. But the Chinese are trying to hold that back. So if you look at the interventions, uh, or in other words, the, the money market movements, let's say, in China over the last um, 10 to 12 weeks, they've been absolutely uh, in line with strength or weakness in the yuan. Wow. And that long-term geopolitical macro realpolitik objective is going to take number one priority over the strength of the Chinese economy, the health of Chinese real estate and stock market and credit markets. That, that is number one. Until it doesn't. <laughs> and course. that's the point. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, more, the bigger the pressure, you, you, know, they, you know, Winston Churchill once said, you kick somebody when they're down. That's the best time. So after <laughs> yes. the COVID crisis, um, you know, China's economy is reeling, uh, then it's had another blow. And I, I would just say to people, go reread or read Janet Yellen's speech, the French Shoring speech to the Atlantic Council. That, I think, makes the point very clearly about how the world is going to work in the future. Are you a friend? Are you a foe? Yes. Uh, Michael, people have been telling me for probably almost nine months now that the Chinese credit impulse is going to bottom. Has it done so already or are, are we still not there yet? No way. I mean, you know, as long as I've been looking at China, which is, you know, 15 years or so now, um, looking at it in intensively, people have been saying it's around the corner. The Chinese are going to ease, they're going to ease, they're going to ease, they're going to ease. Never happens, really. I mean, OK, they did after the GFC in size, um, but... Uh, generally, they haven't done it, and particularly since 2016. There's been very little stimulus. Just look at the uh, the central bank balance sheet, the PPOC central bank balance sheet. It's flatlined since 2016. That's not a central bank that's doing lots of QE. They want stability. The goal of China has changed from growth at all costs to stability. And the stability was all about stability of the yuan to try and develop um, uh, the yuan as an international rival to the dollar. Well, good luck on that one. Joseph, I want to start with you. Is there any glimmer of hope for risk assets, credit, crypto, SPACs, non-profitable non technology stocks? You know, what is there any scenario you can imagine in which nine months from now those will have done okay, if not well? Or is it just, you know, investing in those stocks and those types of things at all is fighting the Fed and you don't want to fight the Fed? No, honestly, the best scenario for risk assets nine months out is for us to crash right now. So we start restart up the QE cycle and then we can have risk assets go higher. Absent that, I, I, I'm with uh, Michael here. It, it seems like things are, are are going to be pretty turbulent for, for a while. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, take a long summer break and, uh, you know, get back and start thinking about the markets again, probably for the early part of um, 
2023. But I, I really think it might be it might be second quarter before the markets or the risk markets really take off again. But they will. And there's a fantastic opportunity there. You know, make no mistake. Uh, there is. Uh, but it's not it's not tomorrow. And so, Joseph, is cash something that you think will have a lot of value if everything's going down? Oh, if you could short, I, I think it, it, you know, sell some, sell some, let's say, tech stocks or something like that. But um, cash is good, too. You know, what I've noticed over the past few months is even though everything is selling off, energy is still going higher. Energy seems to be very, very bullish. So, I mean, I think you could hide there as well. Seems a lot of those companies, they pay, pay pretty good dividends. So, um, you know, it'd be better than cash because you would be potentially having some capital appreciation and receiving some cash flow. And I listened uh, with great interest to uh, you know an awesome uh, podcast you did with George Noble um, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, his view is exactly the same. And this is a trader's instinct. I mean, George is a doyen of international in the US. He was at uh, Fidelity overseas, uh, began in the late 80s. And he knows a lot about international. And his view instinctively is absolutely the same as this. And I think he's nailed this market completely. The, the problem with shorting uh, in a bear market is you get very vicious rallies. And that's the, you know, that's the issue. I mean, uh, uh, I think actually it was it was George Noble who said to me that if you look at Nasdaq, Nasdaq basically collapsed in the Y2K bubble when that burst by something like 85 percent or whatever it was. But you saw 10 rallies of more than 25 percent a day. <laughs> Just think of that one. If you're sure that would, uh, that would certainly, uh, you know, give you a lot of pain. Guys, it's been fantastic having you on Forward Guidance. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, people should definitely follow your work. Uh, Joseph, people would fo follow your writings at fedguide.com. Your Twitter handle is at fedguy12. Michael, where can folks find you if they want to experience your research, see your, see your charts? You can take a look on Twitter at crossbordercap, uh, I should say, uh, the Twitter handle, and uh, our website, crossbordercapital.com. There we go. Folks, buy the books. By the books. They're good folks. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thanks a lot, guys. It's been awesome. Thank you.